Letter sixty eight of Letters from Egypt by Lady Lucy Duff Gordon. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. To Sir Alexander Duff Gordon, Thebes, from December twenty fifth, eighteen sixty five, to January third, eighteen sixty six. Dearest Alec, I wish you all, may the year be good to thee, as we say here, and now for my history. We left Cairo on the fifth December. I was not well. No wind, as usual, and we were a week getting to Beni Suef, where the Stambouli Greek lady who was so kind to me last summer in my illness came on board with a very well-bred Arab lady. I was in bed, and only stayed a few hours. On to Minia, another five or six days, walked about, and saw the preparations for the Pasha's arrival. Nothing so flat as these affairs here. Not a creature went near the landing-place but his own servants, soldiers, and officials. I thought of the arrival of the smallest of German princes, which makes ten times the noise. Next on to Siut. Ill again, and did not land or see any one. On to Girga, where we only stayed on long enough to deliver money and presents, which I had been begged to take for some old sailors of mine to their mothers and wives there. Between Siut and Girga an Abyssinian slave lad came and wanted me to steal him. He said his master was a copt, and ill-used him, and the lady beat him. But Omar sagely observed to the sailors, who were very anxious to take him, that a bad master did not give his slave such good clothes and even a pair of shoes, cow looks, and that he made too much of his master being a copt. No doubt he was a lazy fellow, and perhaps he had run away with other property besides himself. Soon after I was sitting on the pointed prow of the boat with the rais, who was sounding with his painted pole, vida, antique sculptures and paintings, and the men towing, when suddenly something rose to the surface near us. The men cried out, Benny Adam, and the rais prayed for the dead. It was a woman, the silver bracelets glittered on the arms, raised and stiffened in the agony of death, the knees up, and the beautiful Egyptian breasts floated above the water. I shall never forget the horrid sight. God have mercy on her, prayed my men, and the rais added to me, let us also pray for her father, poor man. You see, no robber has done this, on account of the bracelets. We are in the Said now, and most likely she has blackened her father's face, and he has been forced to strangle her, poor man. I said, Alas, and the Rais continued, Ah, yes, it is a heavy thing, but a man must whiten his face, poor man, poor man. God have mercy on him. Such is Saidi point d'honneur. However, it turned out she was drowned bathing. Above Girga we stopped while at Dishne, a large village. I strolled up alone, les mains dans les poches, sicut mius es mos, and was soon accosted with an invitation to coffee and pipes in the stranger's place, a sort of room open on one side with a column in the middle, like two arches of a cloister, and which, in all the villages, is close to the mosque. Two or three cloaks were pulled off and spread on the ground for me to sit on, and the milk, which I asked for, instead of the village coffee, brought. In a minute a dozen men came and sat round, and asked, as usual, Whence comest thou, and whither goest thou? And my gloves, watch, rings, etc., were handed round and examined. The gloves always call forth many mashallahs. I said, I come from the Frank country, and am going to my place near Abu Hajjaj. Hereupon every one touched my hand, and said, Praise be to God that we have seen thee. Don't go on, stay here, and take one hundred fedens of land, and remain here. I laughed, and asked, Should I wear the zabut, brown shirt, and the libda, and work in the field, seeing there is no man with me? There was much laughing, and then several stories of women who had farmed large properties well and successfully. Such undertakings on the part of women seem quite as common here as in Europe, and more common than in England." I took leave of my new friends, who had given me the first welcome home to the Said, and we went on to Kenna, which we reached early in the morning, and I found my well-known donkey-boys putting my saddle on. The father of one, and the two brothers of the other, were gone to work on the railway for sixty days' forced labor, taking their own bread, and the poor little fellows were left alone to take care of the harem. As soon as we reached the town, a couple of tall young soldiers in the Nizam uniform rushed after me, and greeted me in English. They were Luxor lads serving their time. Of course, they attached themselves to us for the rest of the day. We then brought water jars, the specialité of Kenna, Gullahs, and Zias, and I went on to the Kadi's house to leave a little string of beads, 
just to show that I had not forgotten the worthy Cadi's courtesy in bringing his little daughter to sit beside me at dinner when I went down the river last summer. I saw the Cadi giving audience to several people, so I sent in the beads and my salam, but the jolly Cadi sallied forth into the street and fell upon my neck, with such ardor that my Frankish hat was sent rolling by contact with the turban of Islam. The Cadi of Kenna is the real original Cadi of our early days, sleek, rubicund, polite, a Puzna judge and a dean rolled into one, combining the amenities of the law and the church, with an orthodox stomach and an orthodox turban, both round and stately. I was taken into the harem, welcomed and regaled, and invited to the festival of Said Abd el Rakim, the great saint of Kenna. I hesitated, and said there were great crowds, and some might be offended at my presence, but the Qadi declared, by him who separated us, that if any such ignorant persons were present it was high time they learnt better, and said it was by no means unlawful for virtuous Christians, and such as neither hated nor scorned the Muslimen, to profit by or share in their prayers, and that I should sit before the Sheikh's tomb with him and the Mufti, and that du rest they wished to give thanks for my safe arrival. Such a demonstration of tolerance was not to be resisted. So after going back to rest and dine in the boat, I returned at nightfall into the town and went to the burial place. The whole way was lighted up and thronged with the most motley crowd, and the usual mixture of holy and profane, which we know at the Catholic fetes also, but more prononcé here. Dancing girls, glittering with gold brocade and coins, swaggered about among the brown-shirted fellaheen, and the profane singing of the Alatiya mingled with the songs in honor of the Arab prophet, chanted by the Munshids, and the deep tones of the Allah Allah of the Zikirs. Rockets whizzed about and made the women screech, and a merry-go-round was in full swing. And now fancy me clinging to the skirts of the Qadi ul Islam, who did not wear a spencer, as the Methodist parson threatened his congregation he would do at the Day of Judgment, and pushing into the tomb of the Sayyid Abur el Rahim through such a throng. No one seemed offended or even surprised. I suppose my face is so well known at Kenna. When my party had said a fatah for me and another for my family, we retired to another keba, where there was no tomb, and where we found the mufti, and sat there all the evening over coffee and pipes and talk. I was questioned about English administration of justice, and made to describe the process of trial by jury. The mufti is a very dignified, gentlemanly man, and extremely kind and civil. The Qadi pressed me to stay next day and dine with him and the mufti, but I said I had a lantern for Luxor, and I wanted to arrive before the mulid was over, and only three days remained. So the Qadi accompanied me back to the boat, looked at my maps, which pleased him very much, traced out the line of the railway as he had heard it, and had tea. Next morning we had the first good wind, and bowled up to Luxor in one day, arriving just after sunset. Instantly the boat was filled. Of course Omar and the Rais at once organized a procession to take me and my lantern to the tomb of Abu al-Hajjaj. It was the last night but one of his mulid. The lantern was borne on a pole between two of my sailors, and the rest, reinforced by men from a steamer which was there with a Prussian prince, sung and thumped the tarabuka and we all marched up after I had undergone every variety of salutation, from Sheikh Yusuf's embrace to the little boy's kissing of hands. The first thing I heard was the hearty voice of the old Sharif, who praised God that our darling was safe back again, and then we all sat down for a talk. Then more fatahs were said for me, and for you, and for the children, and I went back to bed in my own boat. I found the guard of the French house had been taken off to Kenna to the works, after lying eight days in chains and wooden handcuffs for resisting, and claiming his rights as a French protégé. So we waited for his return, and for the keys which he had taken with him, in hopes that the Kenna authorities would not care to keep me out of the house. I wrote to the French consular agent at Kenna, and to the consul at Alexandria, and got him back the third day. What would you think in Europe to see me welcome with enthusiasm a servant just out of chains and handcuffs? At the very moment, too, that Mohammed and I were talking, a boat passed up the river with music and singing on board. It was a Sheikh el Belid of a place above Esna, who had lain in prison three years in Cairo, and whose friends were making all the fantasia they could to celebrate the end of his misfortune, of disgrace, il n'en est pas question, and why should it? 
So many honest men go to prison that it is no presumption at all against a man. The day after my arrival was the great and last day. The crowd was but little and not lively. Times are too hard. But the writing was beautiful. Two men from Hegaz performed wonderful feats. I dined with a Maon, whose wife cooked me the best dinner I ever ate in this country, or almost anywhere. Marie, who was invited, rejoiced the kind old lady's heart by her Belgian appreciation of the excellent cookery. Eat, my daughter, eat, and even I managed to give satisfaction. Such baklava I never tasted. We were moved to the house yesterday, and I have had company ever since. One Sheikh Ali, a very agreeable man from beyond Khartoum, offered to take me up to Khartoum and back with a tak teron, camel litter, in company with Mustafa Aga, Sheikh Yusuf, and a troop of his own Ababda. It is a terrible temptation, but it would cost fifty pounds, so I refused. Sheikh Ali is so clever and well-bred that I should enjoy it very much, and the climate at this season is delightful. He has been in the Denka country, where the men are a cubit taller than Sheikh Hassan, whom you know, and who inquires tenderly after you. Now let me describe the state of things. From the Mudiriyat of Kenna only, twenty-five thousand men are taken to work for sixty days without food or pay. Each man must take his own basket, and each third man a hoe, not a basket. If you want to pay a substitute for a beloved or delicate son, it costs one thousand piastres, six hundred at the lowest, and about three to four hundred for his food. From Luxor only, two hundred and twenty men are gone, of whom a third will very likely die of exposure to the cold and misery. The weather is unusually cold. That is to say that this little village, of at most two thousand souls, male and female, we don't usually count women from decorum, will pay in labor at least one thousand three hundred twenty pounds in sixty days. We have also already had eleven camels seized to go up to the Sudan. A camel is worth from eighteen pounds to forty pounds. Last year Mariette Bay made excavations at Gurna, forcing the people to work but promising payment at the rate of, well, when he was gone, the four sheikhs of the village at Gurna came to Mustafa and begged him to advance the money due from the government, for the people were starving. Mustafa agrees and gives above three hundred purses, about one thousand pounds in current piastres on the understanding that he is to get the money from government in tariff, and to keep the difference as his profit. If he cannot get it at all, the fellaheen are to pay him back without interest. Of course, at the rate at which money is here, his profit would be but small interest on the money, unless he could get the money directly, and now he has waited six months in vain. Abdallah, the son of El Habeshi of Damankur, went up the river in chains to Fazoglo a fortnight ago, and Osman Bey ditto last week. El Bedrawi is dead there, of course. Shall I tell you what became of the hundred prisoners who were sent away after the Gao business? As they marched through the desert, the Greek Memluk looked at his list each morning and said, Hossein, Achmet, Fulan, like the Spanish Don Fulano, Mr. So-and-so, you are free, take off his chains. Well, the three or four men drop behind, where some Argnauts strangle them out of sight. This is banishment to Fazoglo. Do you remember Le Citoyen et Le Large of the September Massacre of Paris? Curious coincidence, is it not? Everyone is exasperated. The very harem talk of the government. It is in the air. I had not been five minutes in Kenna before I knew all this and much more. Of the end of Haji Sultan I will not speak till I have absolute certainty, but I believe the proceeding was as I have described, set free in the desert and murdered by the way. I wish you to publish these facts. It is no secret to any but those Europeans whose interests keep their eyes tightly shut, and they will soon have them opened. The blind rapacity of the present ruler will make him astonish the Franks some day, I think. Wheat is now four hundred piastres the Ardeb up here. The little loaf, not quite so big as our penny roll, costs a piastre, about three half pence, and all in proportion. I need not say what the misery is. Remember that this is the second levy of two hundred and twenty men within six months, each for sixty days, as well as the second seizure of camels, besides the conscription, which serves the same purpose, as the soldiers work on the Pasha's works. But in Cairo they are paid, and paid well. It is curious how news travels here. The Luxor people knew the day I left Alexandria, and the day I left Cairo, long before I came. They say here that Abu el-Hajjaj gave me his hand from Kenna, because he would not finish his mulid without me. 
I am supposed to be specially protected by him, as is proved by my health being so far better here than anywhere else. By the by, Sheikh Ali Ababda told me that all the villages close on the Nile escaped the cholera almost completely, whilst those who were half or a quarter of a mile inland were ravaged. At Kenna two hundred and fifty a day died. At Luxor one child was supposed to have died of it, but I know he had a diseased liver for a year or more. In the desert the Bisharin and the Ababda suffered more than the people at Cairo, and you know how the desert is usually the place of perfect health. But fresh Nile water seems to be the antidote. Sheikh Yusuf laid the mortality at Kenna to the canal water, which the poor people drink there. I believe the fact is as Sheikh Ali told me. Now I will say good-bye, for I am tired, and will write anon to the rest. Let Mutter have this. I was very poorly till I got above Siut, and then gradually mended. Constant blood-spitting and great weakness, and I am very thin. But by the protection of Abu hajjaj I suppose I am already much better, and begin to eat again. I have not been out yet since the first day, having much to do in the house to get it to rights. I felt very dreary on Christmas Day away from you all, and Omar's plum pudding did not cheer me at all, as he hoped it would. He begs me to kiss your hand for him, and every one sends you salam, and all lament that you are not the new consul at Cairo. Kiss my chicks, and love to you all. Janet, I hope, is in Egypt ere this. End of letter 68. Read by Sibella Denton. All LibriVox files are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org.